Yeah. Um, Okay. I want to, um, yeah, I sort of want to have a try. I've not done this before. Um, uh, bringing music in as, and seeing it as often a vehicle of pride. Um, and I guess to some extent, the reason to do that um, is that I think it gets us into the easily, I think, easily into the uh, part of pride that is very much about a performance life force. Um, and I, I think it starts very young. Um, as the performance life force starts very young. You know, the child, the little one, takes the first two steps and everyone's applaud. Um, and the um, I think you can see pride in toddlers um, when they are simply full of something they have done, which is recognized, okay? And the recognition we talk about in Palin that the performance life force needs is admiration and applause. And that's not the same as the acceptance we need when we're into the caring life force or the respect we need when we're into the, um, the material life force. And I think I, I'm not particularly musical or particularly into music. So I, I feel. Um, to some extent, I'm talking about something I don't know very much about. Um, that I think it's just sort of observable um, that music at times plays a large part in people being able to get in touch with their pride. Um, and I guess uh, uh, I'd like, um, you know, to use the time today to sort of explore that because um, certainly with young people, music plays a huge part of their life. Um, they're very powerful. And in terms of working with um, young people, um, you know, social workers and foster carers and agencies that um, set up programs for young people often well, there are often generation gaps between the people providing a service and the people receiving a service. Um, there are often gaps of values. And I don't think the resource of music is, you, is tapped as much as it could be at all. Um, I'm not quite sure why. Um, I also know for sure that there are some people who are doing that. Um, but overall, and I guess the reason to link it to pride is, and it also um, 
if, if we take the political uh, power of music in, um, in war, um, in the civil rights movement, um, I think we can see both the the good and the bad in it. There's the um, scene in the musical cabaret, the, the movie, the movie of it, the movie of cabaret, when the young Germans stand up and sing the the, the Nazi anthem, and and it's almost hard not to be drawn into it. Um, it is extraordinarily powerful. Um, and I think if America, um, after 9-11, the way the um, national anthem would be just sung in, also, or America the Beautiful just sung in different places, like people waiting at airports. Um, you know, one person would start singing and then everyone would join in. I remember that. Um, so that, and that was pride of country in the face of this attack. Um, and patriotic songs um, in England uh, during the Second World War. Um, long, long way to Tipperary. I grew up with them. I was a kid in Australia, but I grew up with those sort of patriotic songs. Um, I think the French national anthem, um, you know, coming out of a revolution, and I, I, I think it just it, it brings up this feeling of I belong to something I am proud of. I guess is one definition, uh, perhaps, of pride. And then the songs of the um, civil rights movement. Um, the place, this is where I first, where I first got an interest in this topic was the place that song played in the civil rights movement. Uh, and that, you know, has been so documented. And I, 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 I do want to say here, uh, I'm white, male, middle-class, elderly, um, <laughs> and not very musical. Um, in terms of, you know, so I'm not saying I come in to talk about this topic from the inside. I want to be careful about that. Um, in fact, not being musical, I must have been five or six. I was little. And I was told to mouth the words when we were singing, but not make any sound because I was tone deaf. Um, and it stayed with me ever since. And the only... Um, people I've ever sung to are my children. Um, and when I told them, I just said once, you know, I've got a, I've got a really bad singing voice. And I said, oh, Papa, you don't, you, you, I love your voice. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, I think there are songs that give people a sense of belonging. Um, and I think you see that in nations. Um, uh, you know, concern tingles up our back, down our spine, um, whatever the expression is. Not everybody, um, but the power of music. And that's just looking at one part of it, but I think the power of music to carry pride. Um, I think it's very, very strong. 
And I think it gives me a chance to develop this material around pride as something uh, that has within it um, power to really enhance people's lives that we know. Um, and that is because music and tunes enable people to, and songs, at times enable people to link to their purpose. And I sort of want to, in this, I also want to touch on the part in Pelham I men and mentioned earlier, you know, the pride and toddler can feel all the you can see it, the pride um, small children feel when they're out with their mum and dad. Um, and I think that is a sense of belonging, a sense of belonging in the family. Um, I think there is pride in the job mum has and um, and the football with that place. Um, and I think children in a nourishing family grow up with a strength that comes from their pride in their family. And, you know, we define a nourishing family there's a family that um, uh, raises children so they are secure um, and capable of giving and receiving love uh, and capable of fulfilling themselves. And the concept of a nourishing family is not a perfect family at all. And if there was a per perfect family, it could be quite dysfunctional <laughs> because the children weren't prepared for the real world because the real world is not perfect. Um, but, uh, and I sort of, you know, in Pelham, um, from a historical perspective, um, I'm saying that the nourishing family is the best unit, uh, the best organization that we've yet achieved as a species, okay? We don't know how to govern ourselves yet. Um, although what's gonna happen in Congress today, I think is, uh, um, an indication that we are learning how to govern ourselves. Um, but, you know, in, in, in terms of the whole, the, all of us, all human beings, um, you know, we, we don't know how to govern ourselves. With the alacrity and sureness that a lot of people know how to put together a nourishing family. I'm not romantic about the family. That's why I say nourishing family. Uh, evil happens in families. Um, domestic violence happens in families. Sexual abuse happens in families. But I'm not romantic about families. I'm saying when a family is a nourishing family, um, it has within it almost a microcosm of the best of who we are. Just as one little example, um, without ever having heard of us, you know, a nourishing family all over the place knows about passive listening, um, you know, knows about true rest, knows about purpose. They, in what I call an unconscious stream of learning, 
they give that to their children. Their children are given that. Um, the children in a nourishing family, the children are every day being given lessons that will enable them to be secure, successful, and loving adults. Uh, parents don't know they're doing it. It's, you know, uh, at times it's conscious, but a lot of the time it's absolutely unconscious contribution. Um, and yeah, Cynthia. Well, I was just thinking of uh, this very powerful uh, positive memory link um, from my family. Um, I, my family, I, I gen all in all, it was not a nourishing family, even the the um, uh, extended family. I mean, there, there's all sorts of dysfunction. But, and also we're not particularly from, um, at least the mother's side is not from a professional. I mean, they were subsistence farmers. They came here. I mean, they, you know, think, but one of the really clear, um, and maybe it did give me pride, um, one of the clear memories I have is on like Christmas dinners in particular, um, my great grandmother and her two friends, Mike and Ingrid would come and they, the young people would fall asleep, uh, but they would be up drinking, but till two in the morning singing Swedish folk songs. <laughs> and that just gave, you know, I, I don't know, but for some reason that, I mean, I could still hear, I don't really remember the words, even though I've learned to it. <laughs> and it would just, and then they'd wake up one of the uncles to drive uh, my, my great grandmother and Mike and Ingrid home but to me that just you know and I don't know why but I think that gave me a lot of strength feeling of purpose and pride just that <laughs> in and of itself so um, and it's definitely a, a very positive memory link no it's a thank you very much it's a terrific example for this because I think one of the things that music prov uh, provides is moments of pride. I hadn't had that expression before, but I think you know that was a moment provide a moment of pride for them, and and and, it's, and in in terms of you know the dynamic of an unconscious contribution, even though you're all falling asleep, that somehow or other, um, you know, some of that was conveyed to you um and yeah and that you know that social strata that's pride in roots um very 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 much so and i you know i think the way that uh, music i hadn't seen this book before but it's crucial the way music can evoke memory links is incredibly powerful. You know, whether it's, um, you know, song that was around, you know, when the relationship could have been better or whether it was a song that was around when there was heartbreak. Um, you know, mem memory links can bring in um, I'm sorry, music can bring, can really trigger off memory links. Um, and I think folk song is, I think over generations, centuries, uh, it has been incredibly uh, powerful. Um, in sort of coalescing groups, <laughs> community group, political groups, national groups. Um, and and then the music can provide the moments of pride. And, you know, it's a moment of pride. Uh, I want to pull no punches. It's a moment of pride in um, the the moment in cabaret, 
when you know the young men, most of them in uniform, not all of them in uniform, stand up and sing the Nazi anthem. And yeah, you know what they're singing is we were going to dominate the world and and spoke and we're going to kill all the Jews. Uh, it was a moment of pride and a moment of pride that uh, the power of which was just chilling. And I think on the other side, uh, I would say when, because it's clearly coming down now, uh, Actually, we all, we all didn't want it to be so bad, I think, in my view. Um, but it's clearly coming down now that what the issue is, is, you know, white people who have not been very successful um, um, you know, will do anything to to quote the poet Gorman, uh, not share the country with uh, with people who are not white. No, we will go to any length to stop them voting. Um, and I imagine, uh, you know, in the civil rights movement, when the white opposition heard people singing, they're probably scared to death. You know, they're not going to go away. I mean, they're going to have equal power to the rest of us someday. Um, and we will. We're going to win. Um, so I, I, I think pride is a very sharp, energizing, um, fulfilling emotion in which we believe we're going to do well. Um, and there is the positive side of that and the negative side of that. This is the positive side of family and the negative side of that. The negative side of pride is, and um, I guess people who the, the music of the defeated isn't um, saved over time, I don't know. Um, but the uh, you know, using music, I mean, going back to a different sort of example, using music to um, uh, motivate troops um, is, um, is, is there through, I don't know how far it goes back, might go back a long way, um, uh, but certainly in recent wars, In the Civil War, um, there were songs that the purpose of which <coughs> was to make soldiers feel the pride that would enable them to succeed or enable soldiers to have the pride of putting up with suffering. Um, you know, the equivalent of militaristic blues. Um, and that, you know, there, there is a way that that is directly using music to uh, motivate people. Um, and the civil rights movement certainly used music to motivate people. I don't think it's there so much in Black Lives Matter, and that interests me. Um, but the civil rights movement was church-based, and that's where the, and I want to be more knowledgeable 
all about this in time, but that's where the music goes back to the times of slavery, as far as, and I only know this through, through books, okay, I don't know it any other way yet, um, but there'll be all sorts of stuff on YouTube, I know. But if I understand it correctly, that a lot of the tunes came, they brought over with them from Africa. Um, there was music to sustain them when they were slaves. And then they were um, forced, forced to adopt Christianity. So they adopted the church and then turned the church into a way to survive. I mean, music brought the music that they already had, you know, became gospel. And then gospel became jazz. Understand that that's the lineage, but. You know, as I'm saying, I'm saying that from simply books I've read. Um, but the power of it is enormous. I mean, the, the, the power of that particular um, musical history, I don't even know if that's the right word, that particular musical history is extraordinarily powerful. Um, and when you think that, you know, that went on to become so much of pop music. Um, do, you want, do you want to say anything on this one, Cease? No. Not right now. Okay, Mary. Well, I had a couple of comments because I, about, one about music and memory links. Uh, I don't think my brother would mind my sharing this. Um, he, her, he has a very blank uh, recall of our childhood. And um, he heard some, songs in some context I've forgotten, uh, some kind of tape, I think, uh, folk songs, and um, he, he knew he knew the songs, and um, and I was able to supply the context that you know, when we used to play the piano, and we used to uh, sit next to her and learn these folk songs like Barbara Allen and the Rebel Pebble Gypsy Girl, just of a robin, which doesn't count as folk songs. <laughs> And I just thought that was interesting, you know, that that music supplied a link into something that was coming into consciousness. We would have been little at that time, of course. And um, and the other, but the other thing I was thinking about that it seems to me that the kind of I keep getting the word jingoistic, even though I couldn't tell you what it means in a dictionary. That you know the song that you referenced in cabaret and. Likewise, with the internationale or the, you know, you know that that I, I feel like those national pride songs can tip into negative stuff uh, really quickly. So it was like a little, uh, a little disconcerting because when you belong, people don't always look after the embracing bit, like in. The twelve step programs, they encourage a sense. Of, and it's not with music, but they encourage a sense of belonging and an utter inclusiveness. That's what, they don't get it because they're mostly white, but they encourage it. <laughs> and um, so I, I was just those are my thoughts anyway. A bit random. No, I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I think. Um, so songs can be a vehicle of hate um, in some of those circumstances. Um, in, in England, there's um, uh, 
Maybe you could help me describe this, Nikki, if I, if I don't get it right. Uh, but there's a classical music program over the summer called The Proms, and it's on television. And it's classical music, that's what it is. Um, and it takes place in a place called the Albert Hall, which is a, one of London's three or four most famous concert halls. Um, and the last night of the proms, um, they play a very patriotic uh, piece of music. Um, it might be Land of Hope and Glory. I think it's something else. Maybe you can help me in a minute, Nick. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of sort of English summer, the proms and people listen to it. Some people go, a lot of people watch on television. And the last night of the prom, they play this patriotic music. and uh, People wave Union Jacks. Um, I don't know what it was, 10, 12 years ago. I mean, the last night of the prom felt like a Hitler rally, okay? I mean, you could just sort of feel the racism there. Um, and I was at a, uh, we were, when my, my wife and I were at a sort of summer concert, which they also have in England, you know, a music program, is what is called a stately home. That's a sort of some someone's was once somebody's castle in the country. Called a stately home, and they have music program. And um, there was this music program. It was quite good, you know, Beethoven, Bach, Wolfgang. Um, and at the end, they played this piece, uh, and you could feel the racism there. This was in the English, what would, in the English shires. So it's this sort of rural in America would sort of translate to the rural conservative part of the, um, and the, an Indian family sitting next to a um, South Asian family. And you, yes, and you could just feel the discomfort. Uh, Cynthia. I was just thinking about the power. I was thinking of the quote. I was just looking up to see Andrew Fletcher, I guess. Let me make the songs of a nation and I care not who makes its laws. Talking about the power mm. of for good and bad, I would I imagine. Nikki, did I get that? Because I'm not English, I'm Australian. Did I get that last night of the proms right? I've never watched or been interested, but I do know that that is the correct song that <laughs> finishes at the yeah. end. Um, yeah. And I was just thinking of the line, it goes, you know, there's a line, wider still and wider shall our bounds be set. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. know what they decided about that song in the end. It's it, it's the same way that you know chanting USA has become a right wing thing. <laughs> um, so I mean, I, I guess they're just indication of the power of music. I think you know they you know, I guess it's some of my interests. Um, coming down the political historical side of it. Um, but there's the sort of songs we knew and the songs that were really sort of big part of our life at some point um, and how they um, give us something on the inside where I think we're sort of pleased with ourselves, where uh, we feel strong, even if 
the songs. Yeah, if the song rec if the song represents a hard time we went through, when we're looking back from it years later, we look at that. It's on the the music almost provides a way that we turn the the loss, the heartbreak, the um, perhaps death um, of someone terribly dear to us. Um, I think the music enables us, is one of the things that enables us to turn that into a recognition that this has been our life, um, and we have some, and we have pride in it. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Can you hear yeah. me? Oh, do, hi. Do, do you mind yeah. if I chime in for a sec? Yeah, no, do. Okay, here I am chiming. <laughs> <clears throat> Actually, we always sang God Save the Queen before O Canada. But the stuff that's happening with the royal family, uh, I don't know, the, the Proud Boys, the Confederate flag, and just um, thinking about these basic things, which is that they are nothing you're nothing before you can feel pride. And so if you don't have it, if you don't have your community and, and if you don't know what your songs are. So I think that there's a way in which, um, Peter, you've said, you don't take away something without putting something in its place. You don't just take something away. And um, I feel like, you know, there was, there's, if you leave, if you leave people with what just feels like shame, they're going to start kicking back. It's part of my understanding of what happened after World War I in Germany. It was a mistake that came back and bit us. And I feel like it's happening again here because um, I think that it's very clear that there's a group of people who don't know what colors they go in with. Do you know about that? What's that? What, it's very American. You, you fly colors, you know, talking head. David Byrne has been doing this for years in all of the middle states and um, it's part of cheerleading and goes along with the with the college songs and have no, explain that bit to me tomorrow because I don't know that. It's literally flying your colors, which is like banners, which is close to flags. But there's something about flags. Um, <laughs> and the needing to have something to wave that you stand under. I mean if if you're I don't know, there, that, the, the, the beauty of uh, the idea of having one flag indivisible and that everybody could identify with the one, one, um, and then claiming the flag or the upset around burning the flag and then the others claiming the flag and I just get worried. I am. There are people who want to hang on to the most powerful memory of family and past. And it's so you know the the you know when people you know they talk about attack on Christmas or you know when things are now seen. They're all of the violence and death and genocide and so 
shit, I don't know. What are we going to do? I I worked in in Little Italy when 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 people were were trying to say no more Columbus Day, and it was it was bad. It was bad for people um, there. Uh, it didn't give them anything in its place. I think it's difficult. I think it's a. I think it's a naive to 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 think that we can go ahead and strip without putting something in its place. Those are the people who need to be in the middle, while while we're trying to strip away stuff that's very painful. But the thing that from last time was the idea that pride can come from owning pain. And I was thinking, there's the pain of the oppressed, there's the pain, there's the pain of the oppressor. So, you know, when Cecilia is saying as Quakers, we're trying now to reckon with our own, you know, our pain around the fact that we we are a part of the educational system for the indigenous people or whatever. It seems in that way, you don't have to shrink away in shame. You don't lose, you don't lose the company of others. You share um, humbling and ownership, but there should be a feeling of um, that there's some expansion that's possible here, that you're not going to be squeezed out or, or squished to death. And um, I don't know, uh, those, are some, those are some of my, some of my starting thoughts about who's gonna take care of the people that everybody's angry at. Um, because it's just like any child, uh, you know, the pro we, we have to be careful what we do with um, the, scape the scapegoats, um, even if they're rightfully taken down, they're not gonna go without a fight. And I wonder if there's any art more artful way, more joyful way of doing this that feels less violent to the people who are gonna respond with violence. And I really do think that World War II was a response to feeling national shame and being tired of it. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, the pain of the defeated, the pain of the people who were wrong. Um, it's interesting because uh, three people who I feel had a handle on that. Um, Abraham Lincoln, um, Mahat the Mahatma Gandhi, and um, Dr. King, and we killed them. <laughs> you know, we almost couldn't stand their message. Um, uh, I, I think you're right. Um, you know, I, I was close to, um, you know, close to when it was all over. And, and of course, it was close to when it was all over because he didn't live much longer. Um, and what Lincoln said was, I really want to hear Dixie. You know, what Dr. King said, we, we, we've got to love everyone, not just us. Uh, Cynthia. Well, I was thinking about when I was uh, in MCC, I've talked about this before, which was a, a church, a Christian denomination in the gay and lesbian community. And that was one of the real big things about this was, in fact, there was a whole project and they actually made a hymnal um, of, uh, I mean, it wasn't just empowering people, but also changing some of the really negative and super patriarchal messages of Christianity, um, or at least Christianity as it's been practiced. I mean, there was research that went back, but one of it was was going through the hymns, and it was a big old fight. But the big part was inclusive language for God, that you either had to have God neutral or you uh, included feminine as well as masculine pronouns and imagery for God. 
Um, I mean, eventually that got to be too much. I've, I've gone straight to feminine, but I, but what they were doing, uh, I think was very powerful. And there was a story. Uh, there was also a lot of musicians who were part of that, who grew out of that and did concerts. And one of them, uh, Marcia Stevens, she was great. Um, and she talked about the story of, she got some very conservative Christians, you know, together and they were going to, somehow they talked together and were doing an album or or, and they weren't, they weren't really, they weren't a Christian group, but they were country singers and stuff. And they got real nervous about doing inclusive language. Um, but then she took out the hymnal that had it. And, and he said, well, see here, it's in the hymnal. And he says, oh, okay, we'll read what's in the hymnal. <laughs> and he had this joke about how in these things, this hymnal was right next to the Bible. So if it was in the hymnal, it was okay. <laughs> so, but I was thinking about that in terms of, I think that that's where songs and, and, and that thing can actually bring healing and can bring healing in a way that's not necessarily, you are putting something back. You're, you're just, changing things a little and and I and I really do think and this is what I thought when um you know when I was working for uh you know I didn't get involved too much in the protests or anything like that but what I thought was very very important was changing people's hearts if you change people's hearts that goes a lot farther and a lot deeper than changing the laws um, because once you've changed people's hearts, the laws will start to change. And one of the big ways of changing people's hearts in a nonviolent way is through music and through the songs and through, I, I really, I really believe that. I mean, I think that that, um, it doesn't get the kind of recognition that the legal fights and the, and the, the protests had in terms of, uh, getting, uh, gay marriage and, uh, same-sex marriage uh, legal, but I think it had a huge effect and in media because it became less scary. It became more normal. It became more, um, and I, I mean, it happened, it, it was a couple decades between it being illegal, that it being okay to have laws against being gay to the Supreme Court changing to allowing uh, same-sex marriage. And I think it happened so fast, not through protests, but through the work of changing people's hearts. And I think that that's a, I, I guess that's my, Thoughts on that? Muted, Peter. Lincoln, Lincoln had a word for this. I can't remember what it is. Nancy Pelosi quotes a lot. It's not sensibility, but it's a word like that. Uh, and to us, it feels old fashioned. Um, but he said, you've got to have their feelings. If you've got their feelings, uh, you can change things. If you haven't got their feelings, you're not going to. I'm sorry, I can't remember the word he used. Um, and I, I yeah, I, I sort of, I, I think this exploration of pride can get at that because what does it mean if you take, Okay, you defeat someone and then you take away their pride. And then they're going to, you created an enemy. And historically, um, you know, tomorrow you, because I just read a lot of history books, you know, you're totally right about that. Um, you know, humiliated the German nation and that laid the ground for Hitler. And I think there is a danger that there is a danger of the those of us who are privileged to have books on our shelves and education and um, cogent arguments and sing the right folk songs, I guess. Um, there's a chance that we become insulferably elitist and then um, and when we're not going to win any hearts and minds that way. Um, and, you know, a lot of my stuff about transparency in the helping professions and how the helping professions have to look at, you know, how power corrupts and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. And people in the helping professions have a great deal of power. 
um, I think all, all, all those issues are around this, how are we sort of genuinely equal? Um, and that's why I still love it, even though you know, I'm an outsider. Um, but, you know, the statement, I'm Bill, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, there's nothing. He didn't have to claim his victory. And I wonder if there's some, going back to our other theme, I wonder if there's some hope in the way Joe Biden seems to have something within him where he doesn't have to claim his victory. He doesn't have to rub people's throats. In them. They, who knows what's emerging out of this guy? But how can someone learn to keep their mouth shut and not interrupt and passive listen <clears throat> in their mid to late seventies? And he's done that. You know, he's as if he's Pellin's star pupil, and he's never heard of it. Um, but he's taken in, he's passive listening to hard people. I find that extraordinary. <laughs> I find it extraordinary. Um, but I, I think the issue, and, and it relates to pride. I guess pride is, you know, we talked about there's a good side and bad side of hope. and. You know, the bad side of hope is we'll, you know, become unrealistic and do something dumb. Um, but that's a bit, bit of an easy theme compared to pride. Um, because we beat them. We beat the crap. I can't even remember the words, <laughs> um, you know, we beat the crowds, you know, we had great pride because we won World War I. And all we were doing was setting up a total, absolute, tragic catastrophe. And yet, what we felt was great pride. And I think on a, if we bring it down from those issues onto a personal level, then I guess we do, you know, I started this as a counter to pride come before a fall. And, you know, wanting to look at how pride could be enormously useful for you know, well, young people growing up in care. I mean, almost a make or break issue. Um, Cynthia. Sorry, this issue is very exciting to me, so I have a lot of things. But I was also thinking about the musical Hamilton. And I believe, I, um, I don't know how many people here have seen it, but um, I truly believe that if it wasn't for the musical Hamilton, the, Blacks, white, the, uh, the Black Lives Matter would not have had the popularity it's had in the past year or so, because I think not, well, one, um, and, and I'm not, I guess I should explain it in case. It was um, a story about Alexander Hamilton done um, using almost all non-white cast. Um, and it was done in the style um, of rap, but it, it, it elevated rap to a level that, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, and, and the poetry and the cleverness of it, it is just really good. And, you know, you have uh, a joking about how uh, there's a comedians would joke about how um, it had white grandmothers, you know, cry, or grandparents crying about Alexander Hamilton in a style of music they had never listened to before. <laughs> Um, and, and just, and I think that it bringing the pride and there was so many things about um, just even putting 
not putting people, I mean, there, there was also some controversy there, but putting non-white people in, because uh, it wasn't all black, I mean, there was Hispanic and, and various and Asian, non-white people in the story, uh, even if they were playing white people uh, who were historically white, playing the characters that were part of American history and the American story and the American, uh, and it opened up all sorts of conversations. And I, I just think that there, there's something, um, and I remember one thing in there, uh, listening to you know, the rap of the story about how how this he, he very clear how Alexander came from uh, from poverty. He's like, how does somebody who was uh, grow up to be a hero and a, a scholar, and he got better by working harder, and even and it was something I remember when I worked as a, a teacher uh, when I was in my twenties in this uh, poverty. Uh, behavior disordered classrooms, I would hear, it was not even there, children, uh, particularly black children who lived in, in, in some really poor neighborhoods tell me, and it broke my heart saying, I don't think I'm going to live past 20. And that musical said that it, it, Alexander Hamilton in one of his big, the my shot was this uh, elaborate thing says, I didn't think I was going to live past 20. And I was like, wow, <laughs> you know, having kids who may actually have that experience hearing that, I, I just, and I really do think that it, it, it made a huge difference. Um, and, you know, it's not, a, I think it's hard because you don't know, you can't see and you can't measure, you can't tell, but I really do think that these things make a huge difference and make, yeah, I haven't seen it and don't know much about it. So I really appreciate what you're saying. Make me want to. But I did get the feeling that it was a very big deal. Um, and I think it's a bit clear that, I can't remember her first name, I call her the poet Gorman. Um, Amanda. Beg pardon? Amanda Gorman. Amanda. Yes, yeah, she quoted from Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, Amanda Gorman. Um, uh, yeah, I, I read somewhere that she wouldn't have, she wouldn't have been there without Hamilton. Um, she was very clear about that. And I think that, I mean, I, you talk about it a bit more simply because I can't, because I don't know it, but I, I, th I, I think that is the pride came through, right? Am I got the right interpretation? The abs, ab, Americans are absolutely proud of their history because of this musical. Yes, well, uh, yes, it, 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 part of their history in particular, it, it, there was just all sorts of stuff because Alec and well, Alexander Hamilton, nobody really knew about him. All you knew about him from uh, from history is, is that he got shot in a duel and he made the American banks. I mean, so, <laughs> so having that pulled out and, and, and you know, um, I guess he had, uh, uh, Lin-Manuel uh, Miranda had written, had read a, um, uh, had read a biography of him and, and read it and think, I can't believe this hasn't been a musical. <laughs> so he decided to make it because I mean, the story, but in particular, yes, pride in the story, but it also questions the story too. I mean, it's, it, it changes. And he said he particularly did it because he said, I'm writing the story of yesterday told by the people of today. And, and, and that was his goal. And, I mean, and you know, I mean, it's not perfect. There's problems. I mean, there, there's some vulgar language and, you know, and stuff like that, but it, it's, yes. And it's, it's pride, it's pride in the country, but also particularly putting people of minorities, people who were, and not just because of the, um, the style of music and the actors, um, but just the way it was told, and, and they specifically, I mean, they've been criticized for not going far enough, but it was, it did talk about slavery. It talked about, um, 
you know, the, some of the dark side too, but it was, I, I guess it was bringing people in pride, but bringing those who normally felt outside of the story of the legend, regardless of how perfect and, you know, there's been a lot of debates, but it brought, it, it's, in some ways the legend is more powerful than history, I think. Um, you know, the, the American legend, uh, you know, what happened is over in a minute. The legend is what lasts. Um, oh, the end. I, I, I'm just raving. There, there's one particular, the ending of it, and I guess I'm doing a spoiler, but it's just too beautiful not to say. Um, you find out how we actually know his story, and it was through his wife. And, and they're just a surprise. I never knew it. Um, I mean, to me, as a woman, I felt very empowered um, because they said, because uh, she lived another 50 years after he was killed. And there's this beautiful song, Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story, about how she... Um, all the things that she did after he died. I mean, one, she gathered all the evidence to get his story out there. Um, she uh, she built an orphanage. She spoke out against slavery. She helped, and all the wives helped uh, build the Washington Monument. All, all the, the wives of the founding father got together to raise money for the, and things that you never knew about. You know, to me, even as a woman, realizing this big part this woman you'd never heard about had in in just it was just empowering all I mean I there was a lot of oh gosh I'm sorry I'm just going on and on my I think I'm going on to a high now because it was exciting <laughs> we got a lot of time there aren't many but, people I want to learn that but but it's just the the power of it and just the and the power of of giving people because when I worked you know it was heartbreaking when I and I you know I was a lawyer for uh in, in integrated neighborhoods and I you know when I worked in the school the hopelessness and the feeling that a lot of particularly black people had and, you know it, it was heartbreaking I mean I think I went to a huge low I mean a big big depression after it um that's probably why I only lasted a year but because I wasn't callous to how bad it was but just the powerlessness these black children felt and how they didn't feel a part of the system. They didn't feel a part of the country. They didn't feel a reason to, you know, it's like, well, we're so this isn't, you know, they didn't even have feel a reason to work and get feelings of accomplishment because, you know, it's just working for the white guy. I, you know, and what do you say different as a, as a young white girl? What do I say different? But, um, but this particular story was, was just, it, it you like one of the things, and I saw the a lot of interviews with Lynn Manuel Miranda, and one of the things that he said was, um, you know, uh, oh oh gosh, I just lost, I got too much of a high, I lost my train of thought, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know he, when he, God oh man that was so important I just forgot it, uh, well maybe it will come back <laughs> yeah but but just he 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 really wanted to bring people into it and people to realize that this was was their story too and it wasn't just um oh that's what he said that was like, he said he's convinced that rap was the uh was the uh the the actual symbolized the the language of the american revolution <laughs> and, and in a sense i love that <laughs> <laughs> and, and and he he you know like one of the things he was convinced and, and there was a scene where he was playing in the white he was doing the first song in the white house before it was a musical he was just at the poetry rap with president obama and he said you know the person who embodies hip-hop the first secretary of treasury alexander hamilton and everyone's like what <laughs> <laughs> he was a conservative economist he was a yeah. Actually, he, he, he's talking about what, talking about how he came up from like absolute yeah. poverty and he, um, he, you know what, yes, he's got that reputation, but actually in the musical, you could tell it's actually much more complicated than that. He, um, but he came out of slavery, he caught, and he's, I, I think I'm getting the quote right, he caught beef with every other founding father, true, whole solely on the uh, power of his writing and the strength of his writing. <laughs> and to me, that was the spirit. It's just that, I mean, how, I mean, I'm not, I 
really don't like rap music. I mean, I don't listen to it, but you know, but having that whole pride of, of all of that, it, it's just, you know, it's amazing. I, I just, so anyways, I'll, I'll stop. I'm going on and on. because No, is no, no. no you high. <laughs> it's not a stop at all. Uh, because I think it sort of touches on, it's very, very important to me from what you've said, because I don't, I don't know, sometimes, sometimes I've got a funny sort of little tick and, or I don't know what you call it, some wordy person could call it something like resistance to nourishing chain. Um, I sort of won't read a book someone's rec really recommended. I just got a little sort of thing. And that part of me has not got into Hamilton. Okay, So I really, really appreciate this. And I had a sense that I was missing out on something, right? Um, and then when other people mention, I think, hey, I'm missing out on something here. Because it sounds to me, if it's all about my theme of pride, because that, because something happened between Martin Luther King, nonviolence, you know, love them, don't hate them, even though they've blown up and killed your children. And then Malcolm X, um, and both of them getting killed, okay? Um, I, I, I just sort of noticed this, that, you know, Black Lives Matter don't sing songs. They're not about to sing, we shall overcome. You can sort of tell that. So there's some sort of, um, not quite the continuity that could have been there. And I think what you're giving me is Hamilton provided some of that continuity somehow because it's so popular, everyone loves it. Because apart from anything else, it must be terribly good, you know, just as a musical. And I, I think how his wife held that together for 50 years. I mean, that's extraordinary. And that's pride. You're the only person amongst the four of us left that's seen it, I guess. <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to change that. Huh? <laughs> yeah, got to change that. So, he performed some of it in the White House before it was a musical. Right. He he originally was had it as a concept for a rap album. You can probably find it on YouTube if you want. <laughs> but um, but and he did it, and he and he was invited. Uh, I guess uh, President Obama used to have rap jams. I mean poetry jams. And he came to the poetry jam and he said, and he says, oh, thank you. I've been working on this concept album <laughs> and saying about how, uh, uh, how I, I, about somebody who embodies the spirit of hip hop, Alexander Hamilton, the treasury secretary, and everybody just laughed. <laughs> and he said, you laugh. <laughs> And then later when they won, you know, we won everything in the Tonys, you know, uh, the, the Obamas came and they said, yeah, he came. We, we laughed. But now look who's laughing now. <laughs> yeah, and, right. And, and it got and it also got uh, lots of people, you know, I, I think from what I've heard, I don't know for sure, but, you know, I've only heard it. I haven't heard direct of it, but it got a lot of people of uh, black people and, and non-white people to become interested in the history of America, which they hadn't been interested in much mm. before, uh, just because of, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, I could uh, screen share, I could probably put something, I could probably find something fun from it. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, that, that I, I really do want to talk about Cynthia because that's, uh, well, apart from anything else I missed, you know, I just mm -hmm. missed out on that, I, my mistake. Um, 
And I guess just looking for examples of pride, and I imagine it would exemplify. Um, yeah. Well, and the right. story of, oh, sorry. The, no, go on. His story of, I mean, he, he actually, I've started to read the biography a bit, but you know, it's not as exciting if it's not done to music. But, uh, but he can't, I mean, this was a child who came out of, Ab, Alexander came out of abject poverty. I mean, he, w he was white and the story of him in the Caribbean, you know, and there were slaves and he had some, but, you know, his, his it just it, coming out of that background and he actually got to America because he wrote something about a hurricane that had happened and he wrote it and his pastors thought, my goodness, this guy's got, this kid's got talent. And they took a collection to send him to the United States to get an education. <laughs> Although he didn't come back like he was, he was supposed to come back and be a doctor is what they wanted him to do. But he instead he, uh, you know, became a founding father, father of the, uh, of, the nation, America, yeah. of, the, of a nation. But, um, to that. I mean, but, but for, for a great musical. <laughs> oh sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why he's like, I read this. I I thought, oh, somebody must have done a musical about this, <laughs> and they didn't. Um, but the the story of somebody coming out of circumstances that, like I said, I know some kids of the children that I had taught came out of these kind of circumstances, who came out of those kind of circumstances and had. I mean, of course, not everybody is going to do that, and part of it was, you know, a lot of things, but. You know, the fact that it could be done and, and it's done to music and, you know, uh, I, I mean, just listening, I, th I think I've shared this once here, I was listening to uh, the end of it and they had these children, you know, in schools about how he got a lot harder by working a lot harder and being a lot smarter <laughs> and having kids sing that. I, I mean, how empowering is that? <laughs> I mean, just for, for kids to, to to know who, like I said, who, you know, it was funny in terms of purpose, because that's something that from memory links, particularly, I mean, I fail, I couldn't handle it. And, and, and just, but in a strange way, for me personally, this sort of gave some meaning to those really bad memory links from uh, being helpless in this very poverty stricken um, area as, as a young white teacher, you know, who I didn't think I was sheltered, but I found out I was, I mean, compared to, you know, I, I, you know, I didn't grow up worrying about being shot, you know, that, I mean, that's, I didn't realize how privileged that was, but being in that and having it, and I mean, I, I, I went through a depression, I gained a hundred pounds. I, I, you know, I, I just, after that, I, you know, it was, it was bad. Um, I eventually got myself back together and went to law school, but, but just, I mean, even, I, mean, well, I, I didn't even live through that, but even if a teacher having witnessed that, that musical I felt was so powerful. And, mm. and, yeah. and maybe yeah, I'm claiming some things that's not mine, but uh, you know. Well, I think, I, well, certainly with kids, uh, there are different ways kids pick up pride. And, you know, where I started with this, and I can't thank you enough for this, because I sort of thought, oh, well, you know, am I just going on and on? And maybe this stuff is not you. I, I can get into a real down, okay, about my workplace. I really can. Um, and that you've just given me a real boost to think, yes, I am onto something. Because my, and I've not even seen it yet, but I'm onto something that Hamilton is about. But one of the things in Hamilton, I'm guessing, Cynthia, is about pride. Um, and one of the ways it's communicated to the country about pride. Uh, and Andrea Gorman is sure as hell. Proud. <laughs> she quoted uh, Hamilton several times in that poem. Yeah, I knew she did. yeah, yeah. That, was, and, that was that was one of the places where I knew I was missing out on something. <laughs> right? I was being lazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
And Joe Biden quotes Irish poets, okay. Um, uh, that's just a wonderful story. I mean, I can't wait to get into it and particularly the story around it. And uh, yeah, coming back to the theme, uh, thank you so much, Cynthia, that you've, yeah, uh, that you've given me, um, yeah, music's powerful in terms of pride. <laughs> uh, go watch Hamilton, Mary. Well, I was just thinking I felt a little, um, I don't know if down's quite the right word, but the point I made earlier about, the, if you like, the dark side of music and pride, um, I just realised that Cynthia having, even though it's an example and there aren't tons of them, although without music, uh, but the, um, the lilt of the poetry, I feel that Amanda Gorman's poem had some of the same thing I don't know because I haven't seen Hamilton um, but it, I just realized it brought in a bit of hope because when you have an example of something that overcomes that fragmentation by helping uh, people of other ethnicities feel included in the history that excluded them like wow that's such a, a transformation isn't it so, so I just thought that worth mentioning <laughs> No, it isn't. I think there's something about, and you know, I want to go back to that moment in um, Cabaret, which is just chilling. Um, you know, there is the dark side in Pride, and there is the dark side in music at times, marital, particularly music about war. Um, but is the dark side of brain. I mean, the pride of, um, well, Tamara earlier was talking about Columbus. Um, yeah, the pride that we conquered the whole world. <laughs> okay. um, from that little Scandinavian or Northern European island, you know, America, Australia, Canada, big bits of land. So I guess what I'm saying is we can look at the dark side of it. We don't deny the dark side, but we don't deny that there can be evil in a family. But at the same time, I think we can look at pride and the way music can enable us to, can enable people to hold on to pride. I think that's what happens. I think music provides a continuity. Um, that it's, it's just a resource that, um, and I think that's the whole thing about, <sighs> yeah, Rachel, Rachel Maddow sort of made this joke. She said, um, I hope they're all dressing up today. I want them to wear their Sunday best. This is a big deal, this vote, this, you know, lifting a third of the country, a third, of, a third of half kids out of poverty is a big deal. And But she was sort of saying, you know, everyone should dress up for today's vote in Congress. And she was, in her own way, she was insisting, she said, you know, your best twin set, okay? Uh, and, and, you know, what essentially was, and then, and then she went on on a whole thing. She said, uh, "If I was Joe Biden, I'd sign the checks. Okay, I'd, 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 I'd have everyone get a, a, a card signed by me, President, with sparkles and on it." Um, she was saying, he, "You know, he should boast, and the Democrats should boast." That was her point. Um, but essentially she was making a point, you know, we've got to be proud of what we've achieved. Um, and and I, I would imagine, I'll probably get quite passionate, but you know what I'm like. I'll probably get quite passionate about when I get into Hamilton. And, you know, <laughs> Peter, there are all these people who knew about it way before you did. <laughs> 
Um, actually, it's I, if you have the Disney Channel and if you could get a free trial, it's I I think it's it would be in I do have the Disney Channel in England, um, but it's free on the if you have the Disney Channel, it's it's yeah, it's yeah. it's on. The, <laughs> they made a movie of it on the Disney Channel, uh, it, and it's a movie of the uh, the original cast yeah. performing it. So and I think I guess that I guess one of the things that nourishing pride, the pride that really makes the world a better place needs continuity. Um, and I think music is trying to provide that continuity. And then, you know, music can go out of fashion and then it can come back because, um, you know, it was, it was just a time in England where that patriotic music was being, um, became a symbol of the right wing, almost became a symbol of the fascist end of it. Um, you know, that, that passes. Um, you know, we don't have to be, we've only got to be a, ashamed of our flag for a relatively brief period of time. And maybe we can have some pride in it again. Um, okay. Well, we'll end there. Um, uh, yeah, I'm in dark now uh, in England, North in England. Um, and yeah, thank you for coming and thank you for that. Um, Nikki. I'm in Wimbledon, it's dark, it's been rainy and cold and windy, although it was like summer yesterday, and um, sorry for being late, I fell asleep, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm in Kankakee, it's uh, 130 and it's still beautiful and the sun seems to be coming out and uh, and thank you and I'm I'm glad my being excited <laughs> about something uh, uh, yeah Mary received hi I'm Mary in Rosarito Beach at 11:30 not raining at the moment <laughs> okay well we'll get back together in this forum this time next week yeah 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 okay bye 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 bye, bye. 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 bye.